Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Just shout at me if I'm no, not using a mic properly because I don't really know how to use it properly. Closer, like this? Yeah, that's perfect. All right, perfect. So we are, um, our organisation is called Animal Relief for Rural Communities. Um, and tonight we're just going to be covering a lot of subjects that we, well, a lot of things that we do. So conservation, animal welfare and One Health and some of the challenges and issues we kind of have whilst working in the communities. So who are we? Um, there's four of us. So it's me, Tracy, and then Fernando and Joe are over on the on the stools. Um, and we are basically, Fernando and I are veterinarians, um, and Joe has lots of experience in animal husbandry and nutrition and welfare, and Trace brings lots of marketing and, and accounting and lots of uh, experience with the kids. Um, so we all kind of work together and bring a a good, good different skills to, to the team um, and we started in November 2021 and we basically saw the need for um, support in rural communities throughout South Africa. We mainly work in a, a community called Sawani which is 45 minutes outside of Palabora. It is very rural, I mean a lot of communities around here don't have many resources but the reason we chose this one is there's no veterinary support whatsoever, um, and there's no running water, and there's a, an overpopulation of dogs, and the donkeys in that community, um, they really rely on them to transport the water and get the firewood. Um, and yeah, we just saw it was a good opportunity to do some work. So where we work is, is here in Sawani, and as I said, it's 45 minutes outside of, of Palabora, and it, borders basically the um, Greater Kruger, um, this is Taba Ranch over here. So a lot of what we do does, it, it, like a lot of the community lives right next to the reserves, but they don't know anything about the reserves. They don't know anything about the wildlife. Um, and a lot of the domestic animals will venture into the reserves. So what we do does have a big impact on the, on the reserves. Good evening. So how did we start working in the community? So we found the community, we found the location and that's when the hard work started. Um, like many rural communities in Africa, Salwani is controlled by a traditional council. So that is run primarily by a chief who then has head men who are like his agents. And each of the head men have their own designated areas within that community, but they are all answerable to the chief. They, <clears throat> they control all the social behaviour, but we can't just rock in there and start vaccinating dogs, treating dogs or taking them away for treatment. So the, initially we had to set up a meeting with the chief and his head men. Um, that was quite daunting in itself. Um, but following on from that, the chief and the head men then had to have their own private conversation, to which we were not privy, and then they took it to the whole community. And I'm not talking days here, it was weeks. So we had a long, long wait before we got the thumbs up and the go ahead, and then it was pretty much all systems go. So our projects, we'll go through them a little bit um, in more detail, but we do a monthly outreach, we do emergency clinics um, within, the clini within the communities two to three times a week depending on the need. We do a donkey project um, and also Molinazzi, which is the children's project. So our outreach and emergency clinics, um, I mean it's, it's not something groundbreaking that we're doing a lot of uh, there are a lot of organizations that do these similar work with um, there's a halo who works around here doing the vaccinations and health checks of, of dogs and donkeys and animals within the community um, we started off as I said November 2021 and we saw 17 animals and now we're every month between 100 to 150 um, dogs and donkeys and goats and cows, whatever, the, whatever decides to turn up. Um, and basically uh, we have run with volunteers, so we couldn't do it without our volunteers um, in town and some of the, this is Richard, one of our local ambassadors in the community. Um, they, come, they come and help us and spread the word um, and really help us do what we do. And so at these outreaches we basically do rabies, rabies vaccinations, which is very important which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we health check the dogs, um, we talk to the owners about you know how to look after them and that dogs can't feed, you know a lot of 
people think that dogs are self-sustaining, they can feed themselves, they don't need water, so we have to kind of explain general principles, but the overriding thing we try to do is, is educate without judgment. Um, you know, if we see animals not being treated how we may treat our animals, we try not to get angry, you know, and go in there without judgment, and we give them the respect, and in turn we get the respect back. So it's been a really great journey. This is, yeah, us at us in action, um, and then the a group of group of volunteers and all the kids come along and the, the main caregivers are, are the little children and they always bring the dogs along so they love getting involved and they get really excited about it. And yeah. Another project is the donkey project. So because in Selwani they need, everyone has donkeys, so many donkeys and they need them to get uh, uh, firewood and the water so there's no running water, there's a few boreholes throughout the community. So the donkeys get used and as transport as well. So basically when we first started out there, um, so these donkeys, we haven't got one of the old ones, but basically the, the carts and the harnesses and bridles are all made out of whatever they can find, wire or pieces of scrap on the ground. And they cut, they cut into, their, into the mouths, the, the bits are made from wire, so they cut into the, the sides of their mouths. and obviously affect the health, but not only affecting the health of them, it also affects their performance. So the owners notice this donkey can't fetch my water or this donkey can't do that. So we try and show them by, um, if we can change what they're using with the harnesses and bridles, then you know it will directly impact them, but also help the donkeys. So what we have is we have a donkey project where we make the harnesses, well, we don't, but some of our ambassadors in the community make um, donkey harnesses out of recycled fire hose um, and get stuffed with the plastic which we get the kids to collect from around the community. We stuff it with that and it has lots of padding along here so it's nice and comfortable for them. Um, and then we also just make the, the bridle. So Richard, who you saw in the previous slide, he welds everything and puts everything together for us and gets the people together and fits them correctly to the donkeys. Um, and yeah, it's doing really well. And we recently got a, a grant from um, a US organization called Brooke in the US, which um, has given us a lot of funding to be able to continue with this project. And there's Richard on, on the ground where, um, thankfully this funding has allowed us to get him a, a new welding machine because at the moment his welding machine has a, a bottle cap as an on and off and everything. So he's really enjoying it. But we've seen really great success and the owners now realize the better they treat the donkeys, the, the better the performance is for themselves as well. And these are some of the old, these are some of the, this is an old, an old harness um, made out of old leather, um, just cutting into the donkeys. And we've also started, um, the, some of the carts are made from old chassis and stuff. So you imagine how heavy they are for the donkeys. So we're trying to get more suitable, suitable material for, for the carts so they don't have to lug around as much weight. So while <clears throat> animal welfare was our primary focus when we went to the community, we were rather excited to discover that there was also a community hub within the community. Um, it's, a, it's for the whole, for all of the people. Um, it houses social workers who give help and support for drug and alcohol abuse, unwanted pregnancies, sexual health and domestic violence. Um, but it's one of their key projects is that it provides a safe environment for the children within the community in the form of a kind of drop-in centre after school kind of club and um, the children that go there are particularly vulnerable they are un very severely underprivileged they many of them are orphans and a lot of them are born with HIV so the main role of Motlanatsi is to provide the children, as I say, with a safe environment, but also to give them one hot meal a day. And that meal could be the only meal that those children have, the only food that they have in that day. It's government run. Uh, they have uh, 150 children registered with the centre. So the government come in regularly, they do their inspection to check that everything's safe and above board and they say, okay, we can see that you have 150 children that are registered, but on average they have 100 children come in every day. 
They say, well, we can see that we've counted you've got 100 children here and you tell us that it's 100 every day. We'll give you funding for 30. Now, I've never, our hands up, I've never been very good at maths, but even I can work out that um, funding for 30 is not going to stretch to 100 children five days a week during term time. So initially we went in on a Wednesday to provide the ingredients. We prepare the ingredients and we cook and we serve for them. And again, initially we went in with a menu that actually would be palatable for us, that we would like to eat. It's not what they like to eat. So we have a really good relationship with the manager there who said to us, it's nice, but it's not what the kids need. So now we provide a meal that is basically made up with pilchards high in uh, omega-3, high in B12 and high in protein. They mix that with soya mints, which sounds disgusting, I'm not going to lie, but actually it works. It's, somehow or another it works and we throw in some spices and um, the kids love it. And another lesson that we learned actually was we were chopping carrots to put fresh veggies in there, painstakingly cutting 3 kg of carrots every week only to find that for 20 minutes after the kids had left, the ladies at the centre would go around picking up the carrots from the floor because the kids would pick it out. I mean, kids are kids everywhere, right? So we now grate the carrots and we disguise them in the stew. And little do they know that they're eating really nice fresh veggies as well. So we cook the meals for them and we do basic education with them. So we started off with animal welfare. It, it ties in exactly with what we're trying to do within the community. And it was, how do you know if your dog is sick? How do you know if your dog is happy? How do you know if your dog is sad? What do you feed your dog? And that obviously appealed to all ages. And that's, it was a blessing in disguise because when we talk about, and we will do a little bit more about the challenges that we face, we are teaching, none of us are qualified teachers, and we are standing in front of 100 children week in, week out, and they range from grade R, so what's that, five years old, up to matric. That is a challenge, believe me, to keep 100 children occupied is one thing of the same age, but when there's such a, a difference in the age range, but we've learned, we learn and we grow all of the time. So for the little, the little dots, visual learning, that is key to them. Lots of pictures, lots of interactive learning, lots of fun learning. That's how we manage to overcome it. But we still make it educational and interesting for the older kids. So once they've nailed the, the how to look after a dog, and let me tell you that those children alone at that centre have, over the last two years, have actually saved around 20 dogs just by alerting us that their dog was sick or they've noticed their neighbour's dog was injured. By alerting us, we've gone out there and we've actually saved them. And that feels like a massive achievement. So we moved on from the basic animal welfare education and we ventured into wildlife, conservation, education, environment and everything else that goes with it, poaching and everything. And it became apparent that we were kind of fighting a bit of a losing battle in the respect that how can we how can those children have any concept of how big an elephant is if they've never ever seen one? How do they know how tall a giraffe is if they've never ever seen one? So we were putting our heads together, we were trying to work out how we could, can we get them to Kruger? I mean, we're fortunate, we, we live in Palabora. Okay, that's subjective, but we are lucky that we live in Palabora, okay. Um, but we're 15 minutes from Kruger Gate and it makes perfect sense. Let's take them to Kruger. Well, how are we going to, we've got 100 kids that we need to take, how are we going to do that? And it was around that time that we heard of Kuru Camp. I don't know whether anyone is familiar with Kuru Camp. Oh, so these are just some of the, we were donated some comics and we do lots and lots of pictures. So Kuru Camp is um, the, the, the brainchild of one man and he saw a need, he saw that children are the future of conservation. And I am going to get a little piece of paper out of my pocket because I don't want to misquote him. But Peter Eastwood, who is the founder of Kuru Camp, said, 
We cannot expect the community to love and embrace wildlife if it is excluded from them. Makes perfect sense, right? We're trying to teach these kids about wildlife and they've never seen it. That's nigh on impossible. So we took our first group, we raised uh, um, some funds and we took our first group to Karoo Camp in July last year. And it was a life-changing experience for them and for us. To, to be part of the first time that those children, not only have they seen an elephant, but actually have actually stepped outside of their own community. And I'm talking children of sort of 11 and 12 have never left their own community. So it's, an, it's a fully inclusive wildlife experience for them. They sleep in tents, which they think is amazing. There are showers. Now, how much of it we take for granted that we turn a tap and, and the water comes out. They don't have showers in the community. They have to bath, many of them, in the same water. So to have a shower, let me tell you, four times a day those kids were in the shower, right? <laughs> they get... They get three meals a day. Now, bearing in mind that we provide, or they, get, they might get one meal a day at the Modern Axi Centre, can you imagine getting three meals a day? Some of them can't eat it because their stomachs are not designed to eat that much food. But it is an absolutely inspirational idea, and it has transformed some of these kids' lives. It's given them a reason it's given them information and it's given them an experience that they'll never, ever forget. So on the back of that, we went back to our original plan. Well, how do we take the kids to Kruger? So we've, we've been bundling them in cars, in small groups. And these are some of the children that have actually been to Kuru Camp. So it's their opportunity to show off to us what they learnt at Kuru Camp. What kind of... Is that a, is that a breeding herd of Impala? Is it how... Tell me about the family structure of an elephant, and they absolutely love it. So we do a basic route in at Palabora. We do to the, go to the bird hide, to Masserini, to the archaeological site, which they find absolutely fascinating. We scotlet the Lataba Day Centre, and then we go to the Elephant Museum, and it is insane. It's so good. All right, so one, one other thing that we uh, kind of talk about, everyone talks about at the moment, is One Health. So One Health is, is also something that we do inadvertently, but we do try and put more of a focus on it. So basically it's the, the health of the people is closely related to the health of animals and our shared environment. So it may seem very simple, but it is a lot of things that we are doing are also impacting the people. So general things like washing your hands seems very simple but there are a lot of parasites in the water particularly within the communities that the such as giardia that the kids and the people can get so we ask them to watch out for the signs of the animals and if they get it if the animals have it and the owners are showing signs you know we can kind of point them in the right direction other things are things such as tapeworm so we deworm all the animals every month for tapeworm which is again something that the children can get i mean in Australia, we deworm ourselves quite frequently, but I don't know, it doesn't, yeah, and over here it doesn't seem to happen too much. So we try and say, you know, if we see these signs, it might be this, and we can point again in the right direction. Ticks. So this little puppy has so many ticks, it's a, not an unusual sign for us to see. Um, we see it in every second dog within the community. Mm -hmm. And the ticks carry tick bite fever, again, something that the people can get. So we try to teach, you know, we obviously treat them for the ticks when we're in the community, but also teach the kids, you know, pick the ticks off and kill them and show them how to do everything to prevent it from transferring to them. Then last but not least is, is rabies. It's the next slide. So rabies is actually this afternoon there was a, there's a possible rabies case just in Namahali, which is just outside of Palabora. So it's, it's something that is very prevalent within South Africa. It's not, well, within underdeveloped countries. It's not reported, so in South Africa, I think there's maybe 18 cases reported in the past few years, but really it's, it's massively underreported. So what we do is we vaccinate every single animal against rabies, so why do we do that? It's the best thing to cover humans as well, and animals, obviously, so a rabies vaccination costs us, um, for the animals, 15 rand per, per dog. 
a rabies course within South Africa for a human is about four to four to six thousand rand, which, you know, the average income is is not much, not the average, but a lot of people earn a lot less than that, and you're not going to spend your money on a rabies vaccination course because you don't see it as important. Another thing with the rabies is that um, if you get bitten by a dog that you think is rabid, you're meant to go and get post-exposure prophylaxis, so injections and da da It is impossible to find it. We've tried to search around, about, around Palabora and it's almost impossible to get it. And a lot of the community clinics are not well versed in it. So the man that was bitten yesterday by, well today, by the dog in Namakhali has had to go to Pretoria. So it's, it's, it's very difficult and without outside people telling them where you should go to get help, um, they, they don't make it. So what we try and do is just, I mean, we vaccinate every dog. And it just a very basic thing is if one rabid dog comes into the community and bites one, another dog, it just spreads like wildfire. Whereas if we can reach 70% vaccination rate, then that will decrease the, the prevalence of, of rabies. We are not there yet, um, but we will slowly get there. Um, we were named the, well we work with the Global Alliance for Rabies Control and we were the first centre of excellence of rabies control in the world, so we're very, we're very excited about that. Um, but that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just because we, we did the courses really fast and, and got, on top of it, got on top of it quickly. Um, but it just means we have the, the tools and ability now to be able to help people if, you know, to be able to vaccinate, to be able to point the people in the right directions if, if they do get bitten and signs to look out for in dogs and things that seem very simple but really aren't. And another, so our monthly outreaches, you know, they're not really enough to reach the people, reach all the animals for the rabies vaccination. So we do door-to-door -door rabies vaccinations. Um, so far, we've done about 1,300 rabies vaccinations, but we hope to, hopefully by the end of year, have 70% of the, this community vaccinated against rabies, and then we will go to other communities and continue doing it. Yeah, there are a little nice chart about what I just said. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, yeah. Is this you? Yeah. So we have had a number of challenges along the way. We continue to have challenges. Uh, the only way that we can find solutions is to talk to as many people as possible. Why isn't it working? And um, what can we do about it? We don't want to be going into the community to dictate that they must change how they've been doing things for centuries. However, we want to give them an alternative to some of the things that they do. So one of our biggest challenges is the language. Um, some people speak really good English in the community, uh, some don't, and we speak very little Sepedi or Tsonga. Um, so what we have done is we've recruited within the community. We have people that will help us, our ARC ambassadors like Richard, and actually a lot of the older children from the centre volunteer their time on a Saturday or after school to come and help us. And it's great because it's a, a, a two-way win really because they're growing in confidence, they're exposing themselves, they're listening to us so their language is improving and it, you know it's working really really well. The other thing that we do is that we we advertise our monthly outreaches by form of a poster. We have that translated into Sepedi as well. So we're trying to work with the community. As I say, we're not going in saying you must do this. We work with them. Um, the other form of communication that we have is we have a dedicated ARC phone that the number is everywhere in the community. So if anyone has a, an emergency with an animal, that they can phone us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the phone is manned by a veterinary professional. We've set up a WhatsApp group, so any new people that come to the outreach, they're ad automatically added to the group. We send a message out to the whole community when, we will, when there will be um, an ARC volunteer in, in there, so they know when we come in, what time we're going to come, and then we can just prompt them to come to the monthly outreaches. And it's working well, you know, it is working well. Um, the other challenge that we have is not related to heat or water yet, but is um, 
If Lani and Fernando maybe go into the community, they're notified of a dog that's, that's sick. They go to that, the house and they take the dog, they, they feel the need that the dog needs to be treated and taken back to the clinic in Palabora. So Salwani is roughly 12 square metres and although there's one main road down the middle, there is an abundance of tiny little roads all the way off there and they all look the same, right? So if they bring that dog back to the clinic and then four days later Lani says, okay, that dog's good to go, I'm the next one going into the clinic, I haven't got a clue where this person lives. And you know, it's a bit like being on a game drive when you see a leopard and you say, see that leopard? And somebody goes, where is it? You say, well, you see that tree there? And there are a thousand trees in front of you. That's a little bit what it's like trying to find and locate where this person lives. So what we've devised is every single dog that we see, we pin drop. We put the information, the name of the owner, the name of the dog. We issue veterinary, similar to veterinary treatment cards. We put the card number and we pin drop it. And then every time we have a pin drop, the Google map is updated. Fernando is our chief Google map updater. And you hit that community, you put the name of the dog or the card number and it'll take you straight to it. And we're super proud of that because it was becoming a problem and we found the solution. So water and heat is, is a huge problem. So the water situation in Selwani is dire. They take their water from the reservoir and how do we get over that? We would love to have an abundance of money that we could put boreholes in sort of strategic places where the whole community could go to. That's great if money was no object. So all we can do in that situation is we educate the owners. How, ma how many donkeys do you need to pull a cart with that much water on? We're talking with people who do have boreholes. Are they willing to share their water for maybe a small cost to their neighbour? It means sometimes the children's centre do not have water and, and that's quite horrifying when you're trying to support a children's centre. And obviously the heat, we go in there, we can be in there for five, six hours at a time in the height of summer, in the heat of the day. So how do we, we, how do we get over that? We don't. Right, this is Africa. You put your sunscreen on, you stay hydrated and you wear a hat. That is the only way that you can cope with the heat. It's as simple as that. So cultural differences. Um, there's quite a few that we come across, but we'll just highlight some of the major ones. So again, we don't judge, okay? We go in and we see some horrific things and we just try and take it step by step. So we do see a lot of dogs and donkeys with their ears cut off, okay? For different reasons. So for dogs, um, they believe that if a dog is sick and you cut the, the, the ears off, they will bleed the sickness out, okay? Which we think is horrifying, but it's something that they've been doing for years and years. And, you know, we try to ask, you know, why are you doing this? Or, you know, what happens when you do it? Do they get better or do, what? Ha so, and it's kind of, we feel like we are winning the battle a little bit. Um, some weeks not, but most weeks, yes. Um, but it, now we're seeing people realize that, okay, if we have a sick animal, we'll call these guys and then they'll come and get it rather than cutting the ears, okay? Um, it's, it's horrifying, but it's just step by step and just trying to, give them the respect and realising that, you know, it's something that they've been taught over and over and over that is correct. So it's going to be a, a while before we can completely change that. Another thing is the donkeys get their ears, they'll have them cut in half or macerated in all different ways and it's for identification. So that's, so they know that's my donkey. So one way we have combated that is we have a tattoo gun um, that we tattoo the owner's initials and numbers so they know that that is their donkey. Obviously it's still a little bit painful but it's a lot less painful you know we can put local anesthetic cream on there so it's a lot less painful than having their ears cut off um, yes yeah, so that's one thing another thing we see a lot is dogs going into people's gardens and trying to steal the chickens or meeting, mating with the neighbors dogs and they'll get hot water thrown on them or hot oil so it's it's, that's difficult because then there's big conflicts between the families, but we go in there and try and figure out, you know, why if this dog's going and mating a Caleb, let's sterilise it. Or if he's going to get the chickens, you know, maybe we can set up a, 
a runner in the garden so the dog can run all around the garden but can't go to the neighbor's garden. So it's just, just problem solving. Um, and then another thing with the cultural differences is um, traditional medicine. So traditional medicine is, is Look, I'm not saying some of it. Might, some traditional medicine does work, some doesn't work. Again, we try not. We have, you know, dogs that or donkeys that have wounds packed with all different types of things, and it's not really working. But again, we try to ask the owners, you know, why are you doing that? What are you doing? Let's try this way, and then they're starting to see that okay, that way's working. All right, we won't do that, but you know, it's step by step. The food challenge. So, as we mentioned earlier, um, with the animals. There is a common belief that animals will feed themselves, uh, so the dogs can go and you know get their own food, and the donkeys can figure everything out. Um, and you see a lot of malnourished and and not nice looking dogs, donkeys, cats, cows, everything. So that's an ongoing educational challenge. But one thing we do with the dogs now is we try to give them give owners a sense of responsibility. So we put dog food into the local shops um, in one kilogram bags for 10 rand. And so the owners can then go into the shops, buy the dog food and mix the dog food with some paps. So they're at least getting some little bit of nutrition. And then with the donkeys, uh, we it's difficult in the in the winter months. It wasn't me. <laughs> In the winter months, we uh, try to supplement the donkey's food with, with hay that we bring in huge big bales and then also try to talk to the owners about, you know, rotating the different fields and everything that the donkey's on, just basic principles that are making a big difference. And the wildlife, so we do see quite a bit of wildlife uh, being brought through the, the, the doors. Uh, we try to educate a lot of the, the kids, you know, if they see, if they, if you see them, you know, put them in the box, call us and we'll come and pick them up. And we basically will just look after the wildlife until they don't need, well, until they're stable and then we'll send them off to rehab centres. So we usually send them to Rewild or Maholo Holo, depending on, on, on the animal. But no, they're, they're, they're all doing well, all these three. So poaching, is um, is big everywhere. We we all know that, um, and we see it in Sawani in the community. Uh, we have seen firsthand uh, giraffe skins hanging out to dry. Uh, we went to one home, and the guy had got kind of meat hanging up in a built-on kind of way, but it didn't look like beef. So we questioned him and asked him what it was, and he couldn't find the word for what it was but he got on the, the floor and came back with a porcupine quill and told us that the guy on the corner was selling porcupine meat. Um, so we see it, it's there. They are on the border of the Greater Kruger, it's like a playground for them. So we see too many dog injuries because the dogs are working dogs, they go into the bush but by chance they get snared as well. So it's all about education, um, but by taking the children to Kuru camp, showing them the wildlife, we can only hope that they will be the voice of the future, that they will see if there's people that have illegal meat and have the courage to actually stand up and say to them how wrong it is. That's all we can hope with that. Um, so we... We realise that we are just four people um, working for one NGO. We're four very passionate people, which I hope you can realise from our, our short t uh, talk tonight. But we realise that if we join forces with other like-minded organisations, large and small, that together we can make an enormous difference. So we work closely with the Endangered Wildlife Trust, Moholo Holo, PNHF, Global Alliance for Rabies Control, the SPCA, and also Rewild. Um, and we believe that when you combine forces that you can become even greater than you are right now. Um, and I'll leave you with a little quote that I quite like, and it is, unity is strength. When there is teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can happen and we hope that together we can make wonderful things happen. So thank you for your time and listening tonight, and if you've got any questions...
once again want to say a massive thanks to both of you for presenting. I know the other two are hiding in the corner there from Mark. But yeah, for an organization that's only been in the run for two years, two to three years, I mean, it's incredible what's been achieved in a short period of time. So yeah, once again, thanks to everything you guys do. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll have a short little round of questions. So if anybody does have any questions, uh, Kyle's going to start off and I'm going to pass the mic back to Tracy. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Um, also, just can you repeat the question? So that's yep, nice. will do. So my question is just how do us as the general public get involved and if you can provide, you know, just an idea of the cost that it is, how much it costs to send the child to Koru Camp? Or, you know, how much it would cost to get a harness or a donkey or whatever it is? Okay, so the question was, how do people get involved? And as an example, how much does it cost to send one child to Kuru Camp? So the cost for one child is 450 rand per child per night. For that, they get three meals a day, all accommodation in the tents, and um, extensive education. So it's 450 per child per night. It's and the food, I have to say, is very nice, very good quality, yeah. If you want to get involved, we do the monthly outreaches. We always welcome volunteers who want to have hands-on experience for the, um, the dogs and the donkeys. And we welcome people to come to the children's project and see the work that we do there to get involved and play with the kids, help out with the education. Um, we always need hands, that's one thing that we'll never go short of. Okay, so the question was, um, Ronya has some some of the people that she knows and some staff that they 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 want their animals sterilised. So what they decide to do is cut the you know testicles off with a knife or put a elastic band around it or something like that themselves. So she's asking, what can she do in that circumstance? It's difficult, um, but I mean, what unfortunately it's comes down to funding, you know, and you know, you can obviously educate them and knowing that there's a there's an alternative. So maybe speaking to the local welfare organisation, speaking to the vets in town, you know, everyone's we've all got bleeding hearts, so we're all, you know, willing to offer welfare rates or something, you know, or do a steri drive through an organisation. Um, it's just offering an alternative. I think that's the biggest thing or knowing, you know, if they give you 50 rand, then you can sterilise their dog somehow, you know, so I just, I think that's really all you can do is just education and, and offering an alternative and knowing that there is another way and it doesn't have to be as painful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was wondering, is it possible to have like a component for the dog section or training uh, dog handling or so you got kids bringing in all these dogs is it possible to try to get your canine units to come and do demonstrations of how you can handle dogs or how you can train dogs you um, can there's a potentially you, future you canine speak, yeah, definitely. Um, people. Yeah. so the question was um, is there a, a possibility of putting in a slightly different project in for dog handling and dog training it is something that we have looked at, definitely, because what we find is that a lot of the dogs are very aggressive. They're not actually aggressive, they're just scared. So it's the education about how to handle your dog. And we're very fortunate at the Children's Centre that we have a dog who's affectionately named Lion, who is the softest dog in the whole world, and he will do anything to have his tummy tickled. And the kids, it's instilled a lot of confidence in the children by having a dog that that's the kind of dog that they want. So it's again, it's, we, it's, it's a repetitive word, but education about 
if you hit your dog, your dog's going to be scared and it's going to be aggressive. So showing them alternative ways. At the outreach, many of the kids will put the dog onto the, the veterinary table by lifting it up by its back leg. They're not going to like that very much. So it's showing them alternative ways to pick up the dog. If we could get a canine unit in there to just give a demonstration, I think it would go down very, very well, definitely. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, John. So just a quick one from my side. Obviously, I know probably more than most of the audience about what you guys do. But can you maybe elaborate about what you see as the future of Mark? You know, I have a lot of respect for the fact that you've kind of maintained your focus in one community where we see a lot of organizations to try and like spread around and mm -hmm. put as many names as possible on the table. And rather, okay. you guys have taken a different stance. But is there scope or is it in the thought process to maybe expand maybe a few years down the line? <laughs> we would definitely like to expand um, at the moment say again yeah at the moment we are still very much committed to so did every, sorry did everyone hear the question it was where do we see the future of ARC um, so we're very much still committed to Sawani we, we still have a lot of work to do there for sure but yes, we do have exciting plans. So um, we have actually purchased a plot of land in Salwane. And our dream and our vision is to build a veterinary clinic on the land. Um, this would serve all sorts of purposes. So the, the, one of the contagious diseases that is in all communities with the dogs is TVT, the transmissible transmissible venereal tumours. It's a form of cancer and it's sexually transmitted through dogs. It's very, very treatable but it's very, very contagious. And the treatment ranges from four to four weeks upwards. We've, we've just had a dog who we took back last week who's been in since November. Um, if we had a central location where people could bring their dogs they could bring their dogs on a weekly basis. It's just one, one day a week of chemotherapy. That, that's the treatment. But at the moment, we have to bring the dogs back to the clinic in Palabora, where the dog sits for six days, and then it has its once a week treatment. So if we can get this clinic up and running, it, it would open up that we could treat so many more dogs because they're not, we haven't got to have kennels for them. But the bigger dream as well with the clinic is that it wouldn't just be a clinic, we would make it into a communal area. So we would enhance and we would teach about sustainability, so to be self-sustainable, how to grow your own vegetables, community gardens, you know, we have so many ideas. And the, to become self-sustainable, maybe that would sort of deter a little bit from the poaching that they could grow their own vegetables, they could, you know, find other ways rather than finding illegal meat and things. So it's, we have massive plans. Um, we, we have a wish list and we revisit that very, very often because we think it's very important that we keep those dreams and those expectations and wishes alive because and we write them down because if you write them down then maybe one day they'll come true Okay, the, the question is how have the, the chief and the, and the head men, how have their perspective changed with ARC? They have the utmost respect for us. They've seen the changes that we've done within the community. We have regular meetings with all of them. Um, every six months we get together with them and we tell them what we've been doing, how many dogs we've treated, how many children we've fed and our future plans for the community. And this is where I think we pride ourselves in that we, it is very much a two-way respect. It's not, it's not just one-sided. And communication is the key to all of that, without doubt.
Just another thing. I know they're saying with spread, I would say it's quite a long distance to get up to Sawani, but I'm just also thinking for the Palabora schools and stuff like that. Yeah. Our children need to do a certain amount of community outreach work during the term of the year or whatever like that. Have you approached any of the schools in Palabora offering them to come and help you on a weekend or whatever so they can get their community service hours signed up? Yeah, so the question was about. <coughs> Have we asked the Palabora schools if we, if their children can come for to complete community hours? We haven't yet, uh, but we have close links with the headmistress of Kingfisher School in Palabora, um, and she's been very, very helpful um, in guiding us actually, even to the point where we've been asking for scholarships for some of the children at the children's centre, and she's been advising us the. The difficulties that they're going to have in achieving that scholarship, but we we really believe that that all children should go to a community for just one day at least because it's so different. And we have had volunteers come through from all over the world, and they've been affected in a good way, and it's made them very appreciative what for what they they had as a child and what they've got right now and I know that they we can't compare it's like comparing apples to oranges but the the one girl that that and it stays with me still till now she said we were never rich but we never went without and that was something that that still stays with me now that um, she fully appreciated just how lucky she was as a child growing up so I think it's, it's super important and again that's something, a great suggestion and something that we will definitely look into, so thank you. Sorry, one last question. Um, it's always one. <laughs> it's always been long. Um, I love the idea obviously with uh, all the equipment for the donkeys and all of that with Richard, but do you think there's maybe sort of scope to create a little bit of an industry out of that? Um, it's always nice when you can kind of invest in a community or invest in an area and create a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's a chance to kind of create something around that and you can kind of have somebody like Richard run it and create his own business to kind of sell onto neighbouring areas or not really? Yes, yes, and, yes and no. So we've, basically the question was, uh, you know, we were donkey harnesses and, and drivers and everything. Do you think there's a, a way to enable some community members to really start a... a business out of doing that, you know, empowering them to, to build the harnesses and sell them on. I think this is a good idea. Whether it would be taken up or not would be a another another story. So a lot of the times when when we've gone in there and we've said, you know, these are free, the people don't believe us. They're like, no, 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 we're not paying for it. We're not doing that. But it may be something over time that if they see the benefits of it, definitely. I mean, with, with Richard, he, we have covered his salary under the grant, so he does get paid to, to do what he's doing. Um, he gets paid for, on a production basis. Um, but, but, okay. <laughs> Fernando's just telling me how long it takes to make a, make a harness. And he, he sews and he welds and he, and he does everything. Um, but I think it's a good idea whether, I think there may be other business opportunities in other sectors that might take off more than that, but it's something that we'll explore. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the Saturday event. Is that every Saturday or how often is that? And also, you mentioned your WhatsApp group. Is it possible to arrange some a rotating carpool because we're down here an hour away. If we want to go up, so we can, like, four of us want to go up, we don't all here individually, we all drive together. So if you want that group, you're able to do that as well. So basically it was asking, uh, Marlon was asking when we have our monthly outreaches and uh, with the WhatsApp group doing a, 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 a carpooling from Hood Sprite. There are lots of people that do come from around this area, so we have a volunteer group, so if you ever want to be added to it, we'll add you in there and then people organise building definitely because it is a, a long way to go um, and then in terms of I forgot the other question it was monthly you said monthly monthly that's right I the baby um, so uh, basically our next outreach is the 6th of April 6th of April it's usually every 4 to 5 weeks depending but again on that volunteer group we update every everyone and everyone's welcome to come whether you have no animal experience or lots of animal experience you always need extra hands Well, thank you so much for that video.
Thank you. So just a couple of last things. Also, as Nature on Tap, as many of you know, obviously we try and fund conservation projects and interesting work that's been done in our area. So one of the things we're actually funding is one of the school groups going to Koro Camp that uh, Tracy was talking about, which is really exciting for us as a small, small little <laughs> NGO. But yeah, thank you so much for everything. As I said, I'm lucky to kind of see what you guys do on a regular basis. I'm lucky to drag Fernando into the bush with me pretty much every other week. Um, but yeah, lastly, thanks again, Painted Dog, for filming. Always fantastic having you guys around the Thirsty Giraffe and Scales. And just the last thing before we wrap up is if everybody can just kind of move out of the central area just for Thirsty Giraffe to get the tables out for dinner. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.